I'd like to thank Brother Raglan for reading our scriptural text on this morning, which came from Philippians. The chapter was 2, and the verses were 1 through 11. There's a second passage of scripture that I want us to put our eyes on to give context to the title of this morning's message, and that is found in Luke chapter 23, and the verses are going to be verses 26 through 43. Again, Luke chapter 23, and the verses are 26 through 43. Reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible, there you will find these words. And as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and, lam and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breast that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others were, who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on his right and one on his left, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by, watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God? since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It is from this passage of scripture that I would like to draw upon the blackboards of your minds and preach from the subject, paradoxes to paradise. Paradoxes to paradise. Before we begin, we need to be able to define what is a paradox. Well, when we look up that word paradox in the dictionary, we find that a paradox is a statement or proposition that seems self-contradictory or observed, but in reality, it expresses truth. I want us to understand on this morning that the cross of Christ is such a paradox. It was the greatest event in history, while at the same time, it was the worst event in history. It was the greatest act of love, while at the same time being the greatest act of hate. It was both a display of light, but at the same time, it was a display of darkness. And so as we read the scriptures, it should come to no surprise that the death of Christ was paradoxical because his life was paradoxical. See, according to man, the life of Jesus 
makes absolutely no sense. But to those of us who are spiritually minded, it makes too much sense. Listen to your Bible. In 1 Corinthians, the chapter is 1 and the verse is 18. 1 Corinthians, the chapter is 1 and the verse is 18. The Bible reads, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, the same cross is the power of God. Jesus had everything to lose and nothing to gain, yet we had all to gain and nothing more to lose because we had already lost our souls due to the sin problem. Listen to your Bible. In Romans chapter 5, and the verses are 6 through 8. Romans, the chapter is 5, and the verses are 6 through 8. The Bible reads, for while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us us though he stood to lose all yet the great love of Jesus prompted him to come to this earth the purpose of Christ's par paradoxical life and death was designed to lead us to a place called paradise and so there are five paradoxes that I want to bring to your attention on this morning and then the lesson would be yours to receive and respond to paradox number one is this Jesus came into the world that we may enter into heaven Jesus came into the world he came to this earth Jesus came here so that we who are here can go there that's paradox number one Listen to your Bible and hear the words of Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and the verses 15. In 1 Timothy, the chapter is 1 and the verses 15. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and the verses 15. Paul says the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Not only that, hear Jesus in Matthew chapter 20 and the verses 28. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 20 and the verse is 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus goes on to say in John chapter 14. And the verses are 1, 2, and 3. John, the chapter is 14. And the verses are 1, 2, and 3. Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many rooms. And if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. So paradox number one is that Jesus left heaven and came to earth so that those of us on earth may go to heaven. But paradox number two is this. Jesus was born in the flesh. Jesus was born of a woman, that we may be born of the Spirit, born of God. Again, Jesus was born in the flesh, born of a woman, that we may be born of the Spirit, born of God. Hear what the Apostle John has to say in John chapter 1, and the verses are 1 and 2, and we'll drop down to verse 14 as well. We talked about this on Wednesday night, John chapter 1 
and the verses are 1 and 2, as well as John chapter 14. The Bible reads, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And verse 14 says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Listen further to what Paul has to say in Galatians chapter 4. And the verses are 4 and 5. In Galatians chapter 4. And the verses are 4 and 5. The apostle writes. But when the fullness of time had come. God sent forth his son. Born of a woman. Born under the law. To redeem those who were under the law. So that, so that we may receive the adoption as sons. Hear the words of Jesus in John chapter 3, and the verse is 5. John chapter 3, and the verse is 5. Jesus talks about our new birth, our rebirth. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. As we go down a little further, in John chapter 1, verses 11 through 13, going back to that first chapter, John had some more to say in regards to Jesus and to us being born again. In John chapter 1, and the verses are 11 through 13, the Bible reads that Jesus came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So understand, Jesus, being God, allowed himself to be born of a woman, born of flesh, so that we, who were born of woman and born of flesh, may be born of the Spirit and born of God. Paradox number three, Jesus accepted poverty that we may be made rich. Jesus accepted poverty that we may be rich. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and the verses 9. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and the verses 9, the Bible reads, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. And hear the words of King Solomon. In Proverbs chapter 10, and the verse is 22. Proverbs, the chapter is 10, and the verse is 22. King Solomon writes, the blessing of the Lord makes rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. So again, Jesus, who was rich, became poor so that you and I can become rich. Paradox number four. Jesus was rejected of men that we may be accepted of God. Jesus was rejected of men so that we may be accepted of God. Listen to the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 53 and the verse is 3. Isaiah chapter 53 and the verse is 3. The Bible reads in talking about Jesus how he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Fast forward to the New Testament and hear the words of the Apostle Paul. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and the verses 21. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 
and the verses 21, the Bible reads, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So again, Jesus was rejected of men so that we who are men may be accepted of God. Fifth and final paradox is this. Jesus was put to death that we may be made alive. Jesus was put to death that we may be made alive. Listen to the Apostle Paul as he eloquently explains this point. In second, I mean, in Colossians chapter three, us uh, Colossians chapter two, verses thirteen through fifteen. Colossians, the chapter is two, and the verses are thirteen through fifteen. The apostle Paul writes, "And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with Him." having forgiven us all our trespasses by counseling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So again, Jesus died that we may live. And so when we take a look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, which was our scriptural text, we see the paradoxical life that Jesus lived, that he was so great, but he became insignificant to the minds and the eyes of men so that people can see the power of God through him and humbled themselves like the Savior humbled himself so that God Almighty can exalt each and every one of us. So everything Jesus did and everything Jesus became is to give us the right to eternal life. And so we need to think about this as we think about why he went through all of this and how we need to respond to all of this is so that we can get to this place called paradise. In Luke chapter 23 and the verses 43, the Bible tells us that Jesus looked over at the malefactor who rebuked a fellow sinner, acknowledged his own sin, accepted the consequences for his actions, confessed the sinlessness of Jesus, honored the Lord as being king, and said, truly, I said to you, Jesus said to this man, today you will be with me in paradise. The Son of God took the low road, for the purposes of being able to look at individuals like this criminal and save their souls. Jesus came into the world that we, you and I, may enter into heaven. Jesus was born in the flesh and born of a woman that we may be born of the spirit and born of God. Jesus accepted poverty that we may be made rich. Jesus was rejected of men that we may be accepted of God and Jesus was put to death that we may be made alive. Every paradox in both the life and death of Jesus was designed to lead us to paradise. And so my questions on this morning is this. Like this malefactor, are we willing to acknowledge our sins on today? Like this criminal in Luke chapter 23, are we prepared to confess Christ as Lord at this moment? And like this sinner in Luke chapter 23, are we ready to submit to Jesus? as king right now. 
a realization of the greatness of Christ and his sacrifice should cause those of us outside of Christ to fall before him in humble obedience and submission and those of us who are actually in the body of Christ, his paradoxal life, his sacrifice should cause us to increase our love and service for the Lord and for his cause. We're about to sing a song right after the invitation is extended. And that song is when all of God's singers get home. What I like about that song is the title. It doesn't, says, it doesn't say if all of God's singers get home. It says when all of God's singers get home, which means that God has some people that competed on The Voice and won. God has some singers that have won some seasons of American Idol. God has some singers that have signed some record contracts spiritually to be a part of his entourage so that when we get to heaven, we're going to sing. We're going to sing praises to his name. We're going to worship him forever and ever, amen. We have to understand that whenever we come together to worship him right now and we sing songs of praises to him, this is just rehearsal. We haven't even begun to sing yet. The show hasn't even started yet. But the thing is, is that when God's, get sing when God's singers get home, that means that there are some people through the inference of the song that don't want to be a part of God's chorus. For some reason, don't want to sing for him and before him and to him. There are some people that become prideful and are a part of the group, but feel for some reason that they can do better if they go solo. But we have to understand on this morning that if heaven is to be our home, we have to recognize all that he has done for us through his word. We have to recognize that. And if we recognize it, then we should sing with so much joy and enthusiasm in our voice and live in such a way so that we can sing about his wondrous love, about how merciful he was to sinners like you and me. How gracious he has been to sinners like you and me. How it is only by his forgiveness of our sins that we are able to even stand in his presence and allow our praises to be accepted of him. But understand that it is Jesus. He is the one that took all the risk. See, if you want a record contract in this life, record company not trying to take any risk. They make sure you take all the risk. If the records don't sell, it's not costing them. If anything, minimum. Lock you in on contracts. Give you some shoddy contracts. You have people that have been performing since they're five years old and still got to do concerts just to make money because they signed some bad contracts that they're not even getting royalties on the records that they wrote and have sung and have performed over the ages. But Jesus says, I want you to sing in my group so bad, I'll take all the risk. He died with no guarantee that we will accept him. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. He didn't say, now listen, before I come down and get nails put through my hand, I need to know, will you accept me if I do this? Will you obey me if I do this? That conversation never took place. Jesus knew that if he didn't do this, that there would be no hope for any 
one of us in this room. There are so many people that are singing today and God doesn't even hear it because they haven't accepted him. There are so many people that are walking around using the talents and the abilities that God gave him, them, but they're not using it for his glory because they have yet to accept Jesus. Accept Jesus on this morning. Obey the gospel on this morning. Do not allow your singing to be in vain. We're about to sing another song. God's going to hear some of us, but he's not going to hear all of us because he's yet to hear you confess him like this malefactor did on the cross. Will you give up sin on this morning? Will you confess him to be the son of God on this morning? Will you have your sins washed away in that watery grave of baptism on this morning? So that when you come up out the water, God will forgive you of your sins according to Acts 2.38. He will make you a new creature in Christ Jesus according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. What kind of creature? A creature that can sing. God hears and is glorified by the sacrifices of your lips. And God will add you. You don't have to join. You don't have to find. You don't have to search for because God will add you to his church. The only church that you could read about in this Bible. And that church is the church of Christ. Jesus said he was going to build that church in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. He built that church according to Acts chapter 2. He purchased that church with his blood according to Acts chapter 20, verse 28. He adds the saved to that church according to Acts chapter 2, verse 47. So why not become a member of a going church for a coming Lord which does all that the Lord authorizes so that when you obey him, live for him, accept what he has done for you, that when you close your eyes for the last time, just like Lazarus in Luke chapter 16, you'll open up your eyes in paradise, Abraham's bosom, just waiting for that day of judgment where you will hear those words, well done, thy good and faithful servant. And then you can sing with all the angelic voices that have gone on before us and all the saved before us. Be with the redeemed forevermore and sing praises unending to God in an atmosphere in which we will be no ways tired. Doesn't that sound like good news? Doesn't that sound like joy? Doesn't that sound like heaven? It should, because it is heaven. Let's do what we need to do to get there. Maybe you're a Christian. Have you forgotten what Jesus has done for you? Have you forgotten how good he has been? Have we become like King Nebuchadnezzar, in which God has blessed you with a job, and you say, yeah, because of my degree, I got this. Has God blessed you with success? And you say, because of my intellect and my abilities and my skills and management and time uh, management and all of these things, I got this. Has God blessed you with a home and with a car and with a family? And you say, because of my money, look at all that I have amassed. This is your opportunity to humble yourself on this morning before God decides to humble you. Now is the time to get right with him. Because I know we say this often, but it's so true, tomorrow is not promised. We cannot have this mindset in which we say, as soon as I get some things straight, 
As soon as I work out some things in my life, then I'll start coming to every service. As soon as I work some things out, then I'll start showing up to services like I should. As soon as I get some things straight, as soon as I work some things out, then I will become the Christian I'm supposed to be. As soon as I figure some things out, then I'll actually start talking to people about Jesus like I know the Bible has authorized me to do so. Don't wait until you come here really straight. There are so, pe so many people that have made that promise and never lived long enough to do what they said that they would do. But don't you know that if we can get ourselves straight without Jesus, we don't need Jesus? We can't get ourselves straight without Jesus. So come to Jesus so he can get you straight and keep living right so you can stay straight. And you know how you straight? When you're walking uprightly. Get right with God this morning and start walking uprightly while you still have time. Wherever you are in this morning, make a wise-hearted decision while together we stand and sing the song that has been selected.